the front door between the cool inside world and the hostile outside world. <laughs> and this talk is about, I've done things on both sides and started to see the discontinuities and the things that are wrong and some of the things I think we ought to be doing to fix it. It's not about, I want to whine and moan about bugs and things like that. Um, I'm this for Rusty. Um, I'm I'm actually not totally unhappy with the state of the Linux kernel. I'm not a Linux kernel hacker, but uh, that is unhappy. I'm just not pleased. I wish it was better because what what I have to work with is this house of cards. And if you ask people what makes them unhappy, the first thing is change and in the Linux kernel the change is coming because of the growth there is so much growth of new features new functionality new things people want and it causes a really high level of change and the high level of change is it makes people uncomfortable so you know the first thing that shows up on any new kernel announcement is why don't they keep it the same as it was before well we need to grow and that growth causes a diversity, and the diversity is in this case, what I'm talking about is APIs, but it causes a diversity in functionality and features and everything else, and that leads to inconsistency. Things aren't covered, and to me, as a developer who also builds product, that leads to situations where my product is now fragile. There's, I'm using different interfaces that have different APIs, that have different behaviors, and I can't, I can rely on them for the distro I build, but how do I extend the kernel and not break my product? How do I um, add new features and not break things? It, it gets very fragile. And I'm not, I'm not Pollyanna. I don't expect a silver bullet. I don't expect that there will be a grand unified field theory of APIs and everything will be merged together and all the world will be wonderful and if everybody just switched to some meta language <laughs> or a microkernel, this would all go away. Um, and the motivation for actually starting to deal with this was came with, we have this uh, conference we started in Portland called the Linux Plumbers Conference. I'm on the program committee. We're having another one next year. And uh, Jonathan Corbett kind of summarized it. I'll let you read it. But basically, we started as kernel developers to realize that there's more to the environment than our little world, and there's more to the domains are no longer clearly cut. Um, there are bits and pieces. Probably the biggest example everybody sees is UDEV. Um, if you're not familiar in Linux, when you add a device, the kernel tells user space, basically UDEV, which then goes through a bunch of scripts and applies some policy about what will happen. In the case of like an Ethernet card, if I put a PCI MCI Ethernet card, it comes in and says, oh, OK, I know that one. And you wanted it named this last time, so I'm going to rename it to that. Um, well, that's something that's very highly tied to the kernel and the kernel APIs. And this has shown up with desktops and everything else. And I work in networking, so what I'm going to be talking about and the product I work on is very network centric, but the same issues occur in every other product. It's not unique. I mean, Oracle probably has the same things dealing with disks and disk management, but I don't deal with that. And since we call it a plumber's conference, we tend to think of plumbing, all the different bits and pieces. And I call myself at times, I put my blog up as the network plumber because I don't get paid as much of my plumber when I call them, but um, I'm always fixing bits and pieces of things that go wrong. And um, the company I work for, Viata, we put out a distro, and what we have is a command line. And the command line makes a Linux into a router because it looks like a router operating system. So, you know, you say show interfaces Ethernet, just like you say show interfaces Ethernet on Cisco, and it puts out the this set of data. And if you, you go into configure mode and you can configure your Ethernet and in this case this is my uh, a VM and I just did turn DHCP on. But behind the curtain what happens is 
the command line, which is a modified version of Bash, goes and uses some templates and some configuration uh, to run some scripts, and then the scripts end up, basically everything ends up plumbed down into the kernel. So all the things we want to do in the interface we provide end up being hit the bottom into different kinds of plumbing. And it's not just our scripts. We have things like, well, the scripts have to talk to utilities. I'll show an example of that. And, oh, yes, we use Net SNMP and routing demons like Quagga, and they all talk over as different plumbing. So in reality, I've ended up having to, you know, well, I'm the maintainer of these some of these utilities. I have to go fix the SNMP daemon because the way it talks to ask about route tables doesn't work when you have 100,000 routes. Um, or, well, it works, but it takes an hour. Um, so all these plumbing bits lead to issues. And I started to look back and did a little investigation. Well, how many interfaces do we have? And if you look at the red line, you start down here with version 7 Unix. And I did a little investigation. You had 50 system calls. No, this is Bell Labs. You had 50 system calls, version 7 Unix. And then, actually, it went up. This was version 6, and that was version 7. I think it went up to, to about 60. But then this red line with the other point up here is BSD. And I couldn't actually easily find online the source to, because it isn't publicly available to the early versions of BSD because of the AT&T license. But, it was about here. And all, basically, everything between here and there was mostly the addition of networking and other things. Yeah, Paul? OK, I'll probably fill these points in with more data. And then this was about the first version of uh, Linux I could find quickly downloaded. And then it sort of leveled off here. And then as we've gone up into the 2.6 time frame, if you actually got the fine points of that graph, it tends to jump in spurts where, you know, Ulrich decides to add 10 new calls to deal with, you know, some other, uh, actually real case, but some other new feature. And, you know, when you think about change, that kind of gets us settling. Like the syscalls are growing. Well, this is a blobfish. The blobfish is something that actually lives down here in Tasmania, or actually in Australia as well, in the in saltwater marshes, and it's a living fossil. It hasn't changed in thousands of years because it lives in a very fixed environment. All its needs are met. Well, many other things have gone extinct, but this hasn't. And I think that the way Linux survives is we evolve and grow and we adapt to changing climate. And if we wanted to stay with 50 system calls, yeah, we could still have TTYs and, you know, 10 megabyte disks and <laughs> we'd be happy. Um, I started to look at how many different interfaces are in the kernel? I don't deal with all these, and a lot of these are very rarely used. But you know, we have configFS, syscontrols, debugFS. Sys actually, it's the bug in the slide, but basically, actually, and sysfs, and then there's the old I/O controls. And it turns out modparam was the most commonly used way to configure something. Um, but the the issue as a distro or creating admin apps is you've got things where you've got to deal with all of these. If I want to create a bonding device or multiple ones, I have to do multiple module loads to go create multiple bonding devices. If I want to do bridging, I end up doing I.O. controls. If I end up, you know, every one of these has a different interface. And these interfaces tend to go through fashion. And you know, apparently last year ponchos were in. So all the designers had ponchos. And as kernel developers, whatever the new interface is, everybody goes and builds their thing. And we get device drivers submitted, and it has ponchos. But some people just don't get the idea that it just doesn't work that way. And the worst example of this was how um, somebody at IBM <laughs> worked really hard to put SysFS into bonding. And it just didn't work. It's not the interface to use. And some of these interfaces were just flat out mistakes. Um, luckily, most of those have died. And rest in peace, we don't have to deal with them anymore. Oh, I hit the wrong. I thought I'd give a little background of 
why we got to this place. How did we actually f just create these kind of interfaces? Went back to the original philosophers in ancient times. In ancient times of Unix, you had files, and you had pipes, and you had text-based interfaces, and life was good. You could combine sort and unique and LS, and you could build mashups. I mean, if you ever, if you saw some of the talks about the things you can do with Google and mashups, they were doing that same thing on Unix. Trouble was, they did have these weird things like teletypes and the tapes, and there were still exceptions, and they kind of papered over the exceptions. And actually, the next once Unix made it out of the labs, then they had to deal with real applications. The first interfaces that went in were some of the interfaces that are still with us today that are major exceptions, System 5 IPC, System 5 messaging, both of which didn't match the original model and still continue to be a painful. I looked around a bit. I said, well, if we're having trouble with these interface issues today in Unix, I mean Linux, <laughs> transition here. Other people have the same problem. Well, the closest thing I found as being a useful to talk was there's this talk by uh, Joshua Block, who's now Google, who when he was at Sun did the original, a lot of the original Sun API work. And he'll go through, he goes through in the talk, they made a lot of the same kind of mistakes. They made things where they created interfaces, they defined functions, it was the wrong function, or they specified the implementation of something. Uh, so I came away with this, uh, and I think everybody should look it up who's interested in it, but came away with other people have the same problems. Um, one thing that he referenced, which I thought was very appropriate, was uh, to Zach's AIO talk, is that this, this happened with Linux with AIO. Um, whenever you write a major API that needs to be used for multiple things. In their case, they were talking about plugins. You need to make sure before you're done that it works on three things. If you make it work on one thing, you can make it work. If you make it work on two, you can kind of shoehorn it in. So in Linux, they made AR work on block devices, or basically raw disks. And that was perfect for database. Well, not quite perfect. And then they said, well, it should work for file systems as well, for regular files. And various people at IBM and other places worked really hard to make a version that made it work on files that never really made it into mainline. But they never got to the third harder case of, well, can I make it work for networking? And I think if they had actually gotten the design and been willing to throw away their first design that, and gotten all three, that they would have had something that actually works. And uh, this is a book, this is on my reading list now. I <laughs> it, the other issue he brings up, and we sh this showed up in Linux in uh, the wireless, was you don't want to take one API and throw it inside another one. Um, there's been some talk, and every time I talk about this, not, I haven't given this talk before, but talk about APIs, various people come up and say, well, we should throw Dbus in the kernel. And I say, how and what would it do? And now oh, we'll put it inside NetLake. It's like, no. This is putting a wolf in sheep's clothing. What happened with wireless was the wireless API for Linux, the original wireless extensions, has lots of problems. And the main problem is it has different device attributes for different hardware and all this versioning overhead. So they said, well, we should put it inside NetLake. So they took the actual calls that you made with the I.O. controls and just wrapped it inside Netlink. So you got the same behavior, you just wrapped it in a different thing. So you don't get any benefit by taking one API and wrapping another. You get a lot of benefit if you take one API and join it with another, just like you take objects and you inherit. So, you know, I can look at, in a file system, I can look at all the objects and I can also act on them with another API. And that brings up the topic that I ran into, that I run into with my use of APIs is names have power. Any API that doesn't have a way for you to get at it or doesn't have a good naming system is a real problem. So the back to the system five IPCs, they had a uh, an ID you had to create 
that wasn't even the file system, it wasn't a file name, um, it, and different applications actually had to create their own, they had to basically find a meeting point based on this ID. Yeah, they had some hash function that you could take a string and both could agree that they stringed a hash. It was crazy because what it creates is it creates an environment where, okay, you want to apply security. Well, you can't apply security based on the name. You have to apply it on another table which is based on these IDs. Um, and we're guilty of networking. Um, the network devices don't really live in a namespace. And so the OpenVZ guys, if you've been watching the kernel, have been spending a lot of time creating these network namespace patches. And they aren't done. They haven't hit all the different places we use names or namespaces or whatever in the kernel yet. And it's been like two plus, almost a year and a half, and they started before that, so two years. So when you design APIs, naming issues are critically important. One of the most common naming issues schemes you see in the outside world, at, at least in the U.S., in libraries is this Dewey Decimal System. And it's pretty much ubiquitous. It's the way you find a book. Well, it turns out, if you go in the history of the Dewey Decimal System, it was invented by this guy in the 1800s, Dewey, and he decided that, well, there should be a lot of books on different flavors of Christianity and, and, and you know, the religion he was in, and there was hundreds of open slots for that and oh other well more people in the world are Muslims than ever been Christians and more of the world literature is probably about that than there were about his religion so it's a very ethnocentric view of the world so the naming scheme was probably wrong but the fact that everybody agreed that this was a naming scheme they could build infrastructure and they could build basically applications and cataloging around it and so from an application writer's point of view, it's more important to me that you settle on a naming scheme like in SysFS than that you get it right. I don't, you know, if you decide that, oh no, I should really move this around and I should change the spelling of that, it doesn't help. It's just decide on a hierarchy and keep it. But in SysFS, you run into this problem of you provided a naming scheme, you provided a way to look inside the system but what you're giving back is crap, or it's not what you want to give back. So every time you provide a naming interface, it's important that what you provide is useful information. Um, it's kind of like the in the uh, this GUI sets, you b tend to build model view controller into the application where you decide there's the back end about what's going on and there's what you're providing as the API. and um, a lot of times as developers, we just say, oh, well, just put the debug hook in, and we'll put that in. And you want to think about what you're actually providing as a useful inf interface. Because the other example I see is in the, in the, in the Netlink case um, and several other interfaces where versioning and how you would deal with different versions of applications and different kernels is not well thought out. And I haven't seen a good solution to it. I haven't seen the perfect solution, but I think that it really has to be way more thought out than and not invent a new scheme. And all these issues don't get fixed by testers. I mean, we have good testers in our company. They beat the crap out of it. They find all these bugs, uh, uh, find all the bugs, and the bugs are, get squashed, but they don't solve the interface issues. They solve the it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And likewise, documentation is like, if you ever sold a house, you, or buy a house, you have to fill out this huge seller disclosure contract. It says basically the basement leaks, doesn't leak, you know, the toilets flush, they don't flush. This is what the manual page is. The manual page says, if I do an MMAP, I have to align it on page size boundary. And it turns out, of course, just like the seller disclosure agreement, you know, no, it's really to cover your ass. Um, and it deals with how do you avoid these bugs. But the problems that I see are more like we didn't build something that is actually useful. So um, that ends the kind of why, what environment of why we got to where we are. And I started to look a little bit more about 
really what's going on inside. Um, we've got a bunch of applications in the networking space. Some are old, some are new, and each, each, each interface seems to have its own set of applications. So if you want to do interface management or IP management, you've got either ifconfig or IP. If you want to do bonding, there's another set of applications for bonding and another set for VLANs. Yes? No. No. It still uses the old I.O. controls. Um, and each one of them, some of them use one set of app interfaces and some use others. It's just all over the place. And, you know, I guess off the, I mean, this is what SysFS gives you, which actually is an application writer. If I'm writing scripting, and uh, those scripts we write are shell scripts or Perl, uh, mostly, and, you know, maybe some other languages. We have, we have one guy who actually writes things in XSL, which is wild. Um, XSL, he basically, um, it's only for some operational formatting commands. But basically, SysFS is handy because I need to do things like, how do I complete the file name when you type set interfaces tab? And it has to fill in, or Ethernet, I want to pull off all the Ethernet devices in a shell script. And this is a whole lot easier. The other option, of course, is there's many cases where we basically have to take the output of some command and skip down two lines in the third field over. Well, this is semi-stable. If you add a new field in here, I can deal with it. This gets, it only works because I'm the person who's adding the command and I'm the person over who's writing the Perl script. And I know that the Perl script's smart enough to know to look for the next entry. Um, and then, if you look at the different interfaces, regular inter Ethernet interfaces, we've got I.O. controls that have been around forever, SysFS stuff, there's some PROCFS stuff, you can go PROCNET dev, or there's NetLink interface, the bridging has got these two, the bonding has these two. Most of these are, it's like, well, we started with this interface, we decided that it's more fashionable to use the other one, so we'll have the next new one. Um, and each of these interfaces has their own little quirks. Um, you know, they luckily all have file handles. Some of them have namespaces that live in the file system. That's what we like. Some of them have the ability to security per objects. Some don't. What's probably the most critical is that only I.O. controls and NetLink let you do something that's sort of transactional. By that means you want to be able to give a request and get a response like, tell me all the addresses on this interface. Oh, here they are. And you want it to be atomic. Um, these other ones are fine for giving st st static data, but they don't really let you. And down the bottom, the bottom line also here is some of these things are well documented because they've been around historically. And some of them, like a quarter of the things are documented, maybe on some distros in some planet. And if I do the right Google search, I can find the right page. Um, and I started to say, well, how would you go from state bad to state good? And if you look at quality stuff, and no, I didn't work in a car plant, and no, I didn't work for quality department. The, the way they have managed to improve with total quality management, and these are the Japanese words, which I speak Japanese very badly, so I'll try not to say, but basically, they have four principles. They say continuous improvement. If you have a, p the second one is functionality. Basically, if you have a pen, the pen should write. And the next one is use cases, basically, and it should write and be comfortable in your hand. And the last one is aesthetics. It should be beautiful to look at. Well, we can worry about the last one after we get the first three done. But I think it will fall out from that. And the, the step that you, <laughs> off, first step to continuous improvement in Japanese, the five S's, and they, they have Japanese word for it. And they tend to choose a translation that matches. But basically, this is a lot like the process we do in the current in the current kernel community to maintain interfaces. We take things, we start out first by 
sorting, figuring out which ones we want to keep, which ones we don't want to keep, and and in our case, it's a little harder to deprecate it, things, but in a manufacturing environment, you can imagine that they're building something and they decide that we don't need the big hammer over there. It's not part of the process. They arrange to get it out of there. So just like we have interfaces that are useful, we need to figure out what they are, work on getting them out, clean the house, and standardize the work practices, which means documentation and training on what they are and how to use them. And they also have, in the manufacturing world, concepts like the end on cord, which basically means anybody can pull a cord saying, cars are coming down the assembly line and the doors are falling off. We shouldn't do this anymore. I don't think we have to go that far in the, in, in, in the Linux kernel community, but there may be a time when things get that bad. There's also Jacoda, which is, okay, let's automate that process. And it would be nice to have something like the LTP test runs, and if the LTP test fails, Linus doesn't release the next kernel tree until that's fixed. Um, and lastly, there needs to be a lot of training and documentation. And this is training and documentation also for the managers. I think as kernel developers, we don't do a good job of selling upstream to our management why what we do is important. And the reason that matters is because unless people see what this as important and they understand what's going on, they don't want to fund it. They don't want to actually make the world better. Um, there's also the concept in TQM of, of they have Kaizen events, which is basically we're having a problem. We're going to get everybody together and figure out how to fix it. And there's some major areas in Linux that really need this. The first one that actually occurred was at the kernel summit this year. We spent about two to three hours in the afternoon working through the regressions on the kernel. And I think they cut them in half. There was only like 10 of them got fixed in an hour. And it wasn't even like, we're going to sign them out. It was just like, oh, I'll take this one. I'll take that one. The next one, as I mentioned earlier, is network namespaces. We've been a year and a half, and either if it's important, it needs to get done, not keep bubbling along. But the bigger issue for me is I'd like to support wireless. And I looked into supporting wireless in our product, and there's four, three or four APIs, one of which only works on one chipset and isn't in mainline. That's mad Wi-Fi. There's the wireless guys are busy supporting hardware, but you can't get an API. Well, you can go to somebody's web page and they list the stable one and the development one. Oh, but the stable one doesn't actually work, and you have to go pull these three patches, and the development branch might work tomorrow. Um, we really need to get the APIs and all this stabilized and worked out. And I understand that the resources for the developers is on making the hardware work, but if the users can't use it, <laughs> it's in my mind as a routing software guy, I care about how can I set up an access point and make it work right and manage it. And with what's with a standard set of packages and we're Debian distro, I'd like actually to be the point like the standard Debian tools support it. I mean, that's Nirvana in this case, but you know, that's how do I get the the wi I mean, I know how to get the hold of John and everything, but how do I get enough wireless developers, enough pack, you know, distribution people together to get this to occur? Um, the other one that shows up in our business is firewall performance, where Linux is used a lot to do IP table stuff, which is good. And people like the interface, and they like it a lot. And they like to add lots of lots of stuff. And we're fast. Well, when you're fast and they like you, they add even more. So we'd like to be able to get to the point of not just routing packets, but doing all the firewall operations at full speed. And other people are talking about power management. And the last one is kind of a desktop thing, which is my daughter has a Mac with Mac OS. And there's the time, whatever the way back mach time machine. Backup zero cost, zero effort. Why is that on my Linux desktop? These are the kind of things where you need to get a, a 
grouped together, focused not just on the area, but on the topic. And I think if we do this, we can take Linux from having a bunch of interfaces, or obviously this is a Hugo, Hugo followed, followed by Wood, to some, to you know, to where we are today, which is something basically works. <laughs> and I think eventually we can get to something in a fairly short time frame that's kind of like my Prius. It's functional, it works, and it works pretty well. But if you really want to get to something cool, it's going to take even more. I think that that's where we're going to have to start to talk about re-engineering some of these interfaces to work better. Um, and what I want to see for the re-engineering is things where I can write applications easily. They're scriptable. They're not just, you know, data formats. And I'd also like the versioning issues to be worked out and documentation and application side and the kernel side. And also the complexity of these things from the kernel. I looked at, remember that gra the thing where I showed you all those different interfaces and they had these, a, it has interface A and B and this one has B and C and this one has C and D. I did a little analysis. Well, how big is that? So if I look at, it takes about 300 lines of code to do an I.O. control interface for, I think this was bridging. And um, the, but the SysFS interface for that takes this amount. And you, you kind of put it all together and you start to see, well, I.O. control is a lot more expensive and a lot more complicated interface than just a simple proc interface. And NetLink's even less. But SysFS is really huge. And as a developer, actually, I wrote the SysFS stuff for the interface part of the kernel. The reason is, is these kind of interfaces are table driven. They're very easy to use. In fact, the easiest to use interface in the kernel right now is syscontrols. I say, I have a value, provide an interface to it, and that's it. I don't have to provide actors for it. I don't have to manage it or and I don't even have to worry about referencing counting it. I mean, a lot of the pain of these interfaces is what if my module is unloaded and people still have hooks to it? And I think as good operating system developers, we have to take the burden off the actual interfaces and do it in a generic sense. Um, so for SysFS, I'd like to see a way to make it data driven. And ConfigFS, I didn't really talk about ConfigFS except for the fact that nobody uses it. ConfigFS lets you type basically make dir, if there was one for Ethernet, it would be make dir an Ethernet device. And it would do all the right things. Well, the problem with that is that it's really even more heavy to use than SysFS. You basically have to construct, it's like building a file system. You have to basically put in all the locking operations and do all the things for that creation of that object. And for SysFS, the other ones are, <laughs> I'd just like to clean out some of the mistakes and make it more useful. Um, on NetLink. Right. I don't know the answer. I think that we have to, f and how do you do it with a file system? Um, or maybe you do it with something else. Maybe you can. Um, with NetLink, which I and Herbert and some other people use a lot, I'd like to be able to figure out, to get it more documented how to use, I'd like to figure out how to change. A lot of the NetLink code deals with, I have to create this message, and now I have to read this message. And if you look at it, um, if you've ever looked how NFS is built, it's built on XDR and RPC. They have a meta language that says, I want to pass this structure. You encode it for me. And so that gets around a lot of the data encoding errors and a lot of the programming overhead of, I want to create a new message format. I want to be able to blink the lights on my, on my USB hub. Well, <laughs> you like to be able to do that by defining data structures, not by packing. And then also figure out a way to get that interface up into other languages. Um, and lastly, at my company, Viata, we get people to come and they have the newest, wizziest hardware. And a lot of these super fast um, 10 gig and other hardware want to be able to offload control operations onto the hardware. And so I'd like to be able to 
have a standardized interface, which was one of the original goals when Jamal invented Netlink. They were trying to do this years ago, and it never got there, of take the message, pass it down to the hardware, and the hardware can do what it um, wants. Right. Well, yeah, so we're talking about the Netlink today. The Netlink two years ago was even worse than two years before that. It was even. <laughs> but once again, we don't have any documentation on that's usable t to the outside world on this. And I actually went looking in the kernel books in Powell's, the biggest bookstore in probably the Western U.S., uh, how many references to Netlink there were. And there was like one or two in all the Linux books I could ever find. But I have about 20 books. Um, and I, and I finally, I, I kind of did find the silver bullet. I didn't really like it. Um, this is, I didn't bring it. I should have brought it. This is actually a peahun egg. Dan Danish designer made this silver egg. And it's perfect mathematical shape, and it sits on either end. And it's totally useless. It's just a piece of art. So what I really want to say about this is that I don't really want interfaces that are a piece of art. I want pieces of, of useful functionality that, yeah. And that's the end, so I'll take the questions. Yeah. Um, that's a t totally different problem with a totally different set of management issues. So that's actually one of the harder parts of that whole thing is, um, I don't know if you're familiar now, we already have offload in some sense in the kernel, because if you have iSCSI devices and you have these bit things that are basically looking like disk controllers, and yet they have a network card out, cord out the back that goes to a disk array, and yet, you want to be able to sort of manage those things in the kernel, uh, in the space. And there's a whole lot of issues about what we tell them now is go ahead and live in the operating system, but don't try to interact with the main um, system. And so I think that if you were to do that in any real sense, is what they do with virtualization. Each virtual host lives as their own host. So each thing that was doing things in user space would have to live as their own. Yeah, the, the big, the I think this is a beer conversation and not this talk. So I think it's good, and I like to talk about it, actually. <laughs> Just as a question. Um, was there any effort? I mean, I, I have it in the back of my head somehow that if config was rewritten to use Netlink, and that never happened or was never attempted or... Yeah, and and, and uh, you know some of the some of the transition things are, it's worth it to take old inter old names, old utilities, and put them in the new environment, and it's also worth it to say, um, to basically flag applications that are using old interfaces. We already do that sometimes. Like if you there's an interface numerical sys controls, 
where basically instead of saying I want proc, sys, net, whatever, you use a number. Well, the problem was that number space was being overlapped and, and hard to grow. So they, they basically said everybody use the, the, the namespace version. And if any application uses the numeric sys controls, a message prints out on the, on the console saying application foo is, and we could do the same things if we get, but you don't do that till the new interface is stabilized enough and useful enough and you have all the other infrastructure in the distro that you're just trying to catch the outliers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and the other problem is that the, uh, how do you deal with all the other things that got added post that? So the fact that you can have multiple addresses on an interface, the fact you have IPv6 doesn't actually start to fit into the if config model, and at some point you start to, yeah, yeah. You put up a graph earlier showing that um, the, the, the number of lines of code to Im implement a SysFS interface. Uh, yeah. Yeah, to implement a SysFS interface is what, that's four times, five times the, 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 uh, what it takes to implement a PROC interface. Um, Given they're both file system based, object based interfaces, what the hell is SysFS doing wrong? Well, uh, if you look at the SysFS code, the problem is it's all copy paste. If I want to do X and Y, I have to have two copy, one copy of X, one copy of Y, and this code is all macroized, so it's even worse than that. So, you know, if I want to have 10 stats, I have to have 10 different functions, each of which implement offset x of structure y. So they fail once you've given the proper interface. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, they don't even show the magic voice to argument that you can say, oh, I want to print a mint and here's right. a mint of one function. Uh, I think it would be back then, and they might have changed. I now, I know I had a big argument with Greg about that years ago. Well, the other thing is a lot of times these interfaces all have a back personality component which is the first person who does it isn't necessarily the second person who does not isn't necessarily the third person who uses it. So what you're seeing is a composite of all these people. And some of them are, have different ideas. Some of them stay around. Some don't. So I mean, the Sisyphus stuff has gone through six iterations, and it, it never really shrank. A lot of issues were resolved. Um, Before we start looking at the when shall we make it tomorrow. Yeah. Maybe now yeah. it's time to look again. I think that the whole premise with the attributes where you create the macro well. and you don't think it is something for every single one of the attributes, which is ridiculous. Uh, because you just speak um uh <coughs> star and have a generic print int for each right. one. Uh we're basically wasting a huge amount of just space. Right. Yeah. Also, from my point of view, I'd like I use SysFS more for a read-only interface anyway. The fact that you can write some of the things is probably not even not interesting. So if all the attributes were done as simple, you know, ten line, you you provide the three things in a data-driven table, and it gives you the read-only attributes with all the right things would be. Like I, um, I'm a distro person, so and I do a lot of small distro. 
So what I would do is cut it out on my distro. But what we tend to do is we tend to make with kernel config options for a long time. Um, right, I think the mainline kernel would have config, you know, IO control for networking if we ever got rid of it um, for a long time. And, you know, Fedora and my distro and even Ubuntu could ship with it off and call out all the applications, but we need to keep it for, you know, the phone guys who have some binary or some other thing. To I think that's it. I have no more questions from people. Okay.